Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I would now like to introduce our fourth speaker of the day, Mufti Dr. Yasser Nadeem, who is a well-known Islamic scholar in the United States and many parts of the world. He has over a decade of experience in teaching Islamic studies. His area of interest is hadith and the principles of hadith. He has been attending national and international seminars on Islamic themes and topics. At the age of 20, he authored a bestseller in Urdu on globalization and Islam. He is fluent in Arabic, English, and Urdu. Mufti Dr. Yasser Nadim is the founder and director of Darul Ulum Online, as well as a lead teacher at the Islamic Institute of Education in Elgin, Illinois. In order to understand the vision of moving forward and bettering the state of our ummah, it is crucial to understand what derailed this ummah from its path. Mufti Nadim will discuss the topic colonialism and derailment from the purpose. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala Sayyid al Anbiya wal Mursaleen. وَعَلَىٰ آلِهِ وَصَحْبِهِ أَجْمَعِينَ أَمَّا بَعْدْ فَقَدْ قَالَ اللَّهُ تَعَالَىٰ فِي كَلَامِهِ الْمَجِيدِ إِنَّ الْمُلُوكَ إِذَا دَخَلُوا قَرِيَةً أَفْسَدُوهَا وَجَعَلُوا أَعِزَّةَ أَهْلِهَا أَذِلَّةً وَكَذَلِكَ يَفْعَلُونَ Respected brothers and sisters, Alhamdulillah, it is a great honor for me to be here among you and I would like to congratulate our brother Shirazi for having this beautiful facility and converting this house of shirk into the house of Tawheed, MashaAllah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us many houses like this that we convert them into the houses of Tawheed and raise the words of Allah bi'iznillahi ta'ala. The ayah I recited is from Surah An-Naml. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and he's describing the statement of the Queen of Saba. When she says, and she is consulting with her people after receiving a letter from Sayyidina Sulaiman alayhi salatu wasalam. And Sayyidina Sulaiman alayhi salatu wasalam gave a very clear, straightforward warning that you have to accept Islam and come to me. There is no if and but. There is no ambiguity there. So, the Queen of Saba said that Inna al muluka idha dakhalu qariyatan. This is what the kings do when they enter a village, when, a, when they enter a city, afsaduha, they ruin it. Waja'alu a'izzata ahliha adilla, and they render the honored of its people humble. Wakadalika yafa'aloon, and Thus do they do. This ayah has a very clear message in it. And the message is that when one civilization overcomes the other civilization, then what happens? The standards are changed. The norms are changed. So if we go back in history, for example, Let's say go back before 1960. So the norms, the culture in this country, and we're not, I'm not talking about the culture of a Muslim country, I'm talking about the culture of a non-Muslim country. It was completely different than how it is now. 1960 is the year when this country witnessed the sexual revolution. Let's go back in history 70, 80 years ago, and you will see that homosexuality was not common. It was a taboo. P 
People would not proudly come out of the closet as they do now. But now, homosexuality is not only okay, but it is celebrated. People proudly say that I'm this and that. So the, a civilization overcomes another civilization. And it's not happening only in this country, it is happening almost everywhere. You go to Pakistan, you go to India, you go to other Muslim countries. In Pakistan, for instance, they have this yearly women march. And what happens in this march, they not only they talk about women's rights, but they also talk about transgender's right, they talk about LGBT issues, all these issues that were once upon a time were not considered issues at all. Why is it happening in Pakistan where 97% population is Muslim? Why is it happening in India where majority of the population they are either Hindus or Muslims? Why is it happening in Malaysia? Why is it happening in Indonesia? It's because we have a civilization that is taking over other civilizations. This is, it is called the predominant Western civilization, which is the result of colonialism, and now it is promoting post-colonialism. We are living in post-colonial era. So, respected brothers and sisters, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in this ayah that one, when a civilization takes over, another civilization, then it not only impacts its politics, but also it influences its culture, it influences its lifestyle, and the mindset, the thinking of its people. So, we are witnessing, and we have been witnessing, the results and the fruits of the Western civilization for so many years. This Western civilization has four foundations. The first foundation of the civilization is its association to the Greek philosophy and Greek intellectual thought. You see everywhere, they, their art, their culture, their architecture, everything is inspired by Greek era. Greek philosophy it is still discussed in universities, still celebrated in uh, different areas, different uh, institutions. For example, there is a debate in philosophy which has been going on for the last 2,000 years. And the debate is, how do we know what we know? And there are two approaches. The first approach, the traditional uh, Greek approach, was that we are rationalist, ultra-rationalist which means that we can only know through rationality. There is no way we can know anything through seeing or hearing or touching. So these ultra-rationalists did not believe in any empirical data. They did not believe in their five senses. That's one approach. On the other side, there was another approach that we only believe in what we see. That's called empiricism. So you have rationalism and empiricism and these two were discussed in Greek philosophy. We are still discussing them. And you see, predominantly people believe that we only believe in what we see. Therefore, we don't believe in God because we cannot see God. So the reason why people do not believe in Jannah, they don't believe in Jahannam, they don't believe in the Day of Judgment, they, believe, they don't believe in Resurrection, they don't believe in Jinn, they don't believe in Malaika, they don't believe in Allah. Because they think that the standard of believing in anything is to be able to see and we're not able to see any of these things. This is called empiricism and empiricism is a, sign, is a, is a, is a branch of scientism. So that's the first <clears throat> base and foundation of Western civilization. The second foundation of the Western civilization is Roman style expansionism. Which means that the Western civilization does not want to limit itself to Europe and America. It wants to reach everywhere. It wants to reach Pakistan, India, and not only that, Saudi Arabia. And in Saudi Arabia, it wants to reach Mecca and Medina. And in many parts of the Islamic world, it, it is there. So this Roman style expansionism is also 
it's the second foundation of the Western civilization. There are two examples that I can give in order to explain this phenomenon. The first example is colonialism, and the second example is post-colonialism. In colonialism, there was an incident in 1943. And let me tell you the difference between the two. I'm sure you've learned the difference since you guys are listening to different talks around the same topic since yesterday. But colonialism believed in direct intervention that a colonizer would have its own government on in, in its colonies. Whereas in post-colonialism, the colonizer do not have direct intervention, intervention but they, they like to take over other people's resources. So what happened in colonial era, in 1943, there was a huge, massive famine. It's called Bengal famine in 1943 which claimed the life of three to, two to three million people, Muslims and non-Muslims. Why? Because Winston Churchill had a policy that the rice crops of Bengal region, all of them should be sent to England. Colonizers deserve to eat, not the people in, who, who are living in colonies. They, are, they were taking other people's resources. It is just one example. There are examples from Algeria. There are examples from uh, other parts of the world. Then what happened in post-colonial era? Post-colonial era begins after the Second World War. In 19, around 1975, when the former king of Saudi Arabia, King Faisal, said in one of his interviews that because of Europe's continuous support of Zionism, it is difficult, it's getting difficult to continue oil production. He just said this, and what happened to him we all know. He was assassinated by his own nephew. Because the Western civilization, the Western countries, the colonizers, they want their resources. They, want, they wanted the oil that Saudi Arabia, that Qatar, that Emirat, and other Muslim countries produce. Either you continue the production according to our conditions or you will be killed. That was a clear message that was given by these post-colonial countries. So, the second foundation of Western civilization is Roman-style expansionism, which they have been doing till today for the last four to five hundred years. The third foundation of Western civilization is Christianity flavor and loyalty to the cross. You know, this country, they do everything against the Bible. The Bible does not exist in their constitution. It doesn't exist in their law. But they say on their dollar bill, in God we trust. So this is the Christianity flavor that I'm talking about. Loyalty to the cross is there. So that everybody is happy. Those who believe in Christianity and those who do not believe in Christianity or in any religion, they're all happy. Those who believe in Christianity, they think, oh yeah, in God we trust. And those who don't, they have the constitution, they have all laws, all regulations that are based on secularism. This is the first country that proposed the idea of separation between the church and state. So that is the third foundation. And then the fourth and the most dangerous foundation is introduction of different modes and different ideologies that render human being as God. It is called, for example, humanism. So what happens in humanism? A human is given this message that you decide your fate. You decide your fate future. You are the one responsible to map and shape your lifestyle. There is no supernatural power. This is called humanism. Humanism is also a product of colonialism and post-colonialism. Because of humanism, we have apostasy. You know, the State Department cannot spend a single dollar on promoting any religion, including Christianity, because this is a secular country. Okay, we get it. But the State Department is ready to spend millions of dollars on promoting atheism and humanism. So we won't promote any religion. But we will promote any ideology which is against every religion. This is what's happening in this country. They're spending hundreds of millions of dollars 
And they're giving those millions of dollars to different NGOs in the Islamic world, in Pakistan, in Saudi Arabia, in Malaysia, in Indonesia, in other parts of the world, so that these NGOs, they work for democracy, and they work for humanism, they work for secularism, they work for atheism, and they work for all other liberal ideologies such as feminism and whatnot. How in the world people, small NGOs that nobody was aware of them, they are able to organize powerful women marches in Pakistan. They're capturing the attention of the international media because they have now millions of dollars in their pocket. Who's providing this, this money? The State Department, the other Western countries. So these four things are the foundation of the Western civilization. So as I said, respected brothers and sisters, that we're living in a post-colonial era. And in this era, in fact from the colonial, colonial time, the strongest weapon of the colonizers is the education system. Lord Macaulay, in 1835, proposed the idea that we should control the education system of all the colonies. And this is what they did since 1835. Now you go to all the Muslim countries. Just a few years ago, in Saudi Arabia, the school education was under the state, gov state control. They had their own people who would make curriculum. The curriculum had Islamic studies, Quran, Hadith, Aqidah, and everything. But slowly, the idea was proposed to the Saudi government that the curriculum for your schools will be made from Washington DC because the education system should be in their control in order to have a group of reformers in every country that they call reformers why are they so interested in education system in Afghanistan why are they so bothered that the Afghanistani government is not providing education to its women why are they so bothered about it because if the Western education system doesn't exist in Afghanistan, then they won't have the class of reformers over there. They want to have reformers in every society. And the word I'm using, reformers, is not that I, want, I would like to use, because reformation is, is a noble thing. Islah is a noble thing. The word reformer was given by the people in the Rand report. This is the report that advised the American government that this, these are the tactics that you have to do in order to control Islam. In order to control the Islamists. Islamists are those people who, do, who believe that legislation should be on the basis of the Quran and the Sunnah. If this is your Aqidah, you're not even doing anything. If this is your Aqidah, then you are an Islamist according to this report. And those who oppose you on this Aqidah, they are the reformers. The Rand report suggests that these reformers should be, should be helped. We should provide them help wherever they are. What type of help? We all know. And they're doing it openly. They're stating that we are giving these many million dollars to this NGO and then that NGO uh, in Pakistan and Afghanistan and other places. In fact, this report also raises its concern about the second source of the Sharia, which is the Hadith of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It says that if you do an unbiased analysis, that you will know that Hadith is not a, is, is not a reliable source of the legislation. It's not a reliable source of the legislation. This is what's written in the Rand report. Now think about this. If the Rand report and the people who wrote this report, they wanted to advise the American government to control the colonies, then they should advise them what to do politically. But they're advising them that even make hadith, hadith unreliable. Quran should be unreliable. Do you remember that famous interview, I should say infamous interview by MBS a few years ago when he was talking about the hadith, akhbarul ahad and hadith mutawatir and whatnot? He was saying that the, uh, uh, if, I, if there is khabar wahid, then I will think twice before I accept it. 
we will accept a hadith mutawatir. How many hadith mutawatir are there? Not many. But when you say that akhbarul ahad or a hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we can do their interpretation however we, we, we want and we can change their interpretation depending on the need of our time. Then in other words, you're saying that we don't care about the hadith. This is exactly what the Rand report in 2003 and 2007 suggested. So we're seeing it in front of our own eyes what the post-colonials are doing. So, that reminded me a hadith. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Sayati ala nasi sanawatun khadda'at. There will be a few years. People will see those few years. Sanawatun khadda'at, full of deception. What's going to happen in these years? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Yusaddaqu fiha al kathib that a liar will be considered the most truthful person. And the truthful person should be considered a liar. And then, So a person who deceives, he will be declared trustworthy. And a trustworthy person will be declared a person of deception. And then, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, وَيَتَكَلَّمُ فِيهَا الرُّوَيْبِضَةِ Ruwaybidah will, will speak in those days. Even Sahaba radiyallahu anhum didn't understand what Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam meant by this word. So Sahaba said, Ya Rasulullah, وَمَا الرُّوَيْبِضَةِ What is Ruwaybidah? What do you mean by Ruwaybidah? So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, الرَّجُلُ التَّافِهُ يَتَكَلَّمُ فِي أَمْرِ الْعَامَّةِ That's Ruwaybidah. Meaning an insignificant, worthless person talking about the affairs that are in the interest of the masses. Now these reformers that we see in every community, literally they are worthless. They have no value when it comes to academia. They have no value when it comes to Islamic studies. They have no value when it comes to education, Islamic aqeedah, ahadith, the Quran, they know nothing. But they will talk about how can a Muslim society be compatible with a non-Muslim society? How can the Quran be compatible with science? How can a hadith be, a hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam be compatible with the modern era? So these are ruwaybidah that are being funded by the colonizers. We are living in those sanawatin khadda'at. We are living, we're witnessing that time when things are full of deception. And that is the prediction of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So this post-colonialism has given us many gifts. One of them is apostasy and atheism. This is one of the biggest results of post-colonialism. I'm sure I see a lot of youth, mashallah, in the crowd. You go to your universities, you're in your colleges. I'm sure each one of you know many Muslims who are not Muslims anymore. And this is not the case only in America or in France or in other Western countries. It's happening in Pakistan. It's happening in India. It's happening in Malaysia. It's happening in Saudi Arabia. And I'm telling you that if Saudi government today abolishes the law of apostasy, that no problem, you can exercise your religion, whatever you like, or you can, if you want, you, want, you can renounce Islam. Thousands of them will declare that they are apostate, open public apostate in Saudi Arabia, in Mecca, in Medina. That is the situation. So it's not like, this is not Islam's failure. This is not Muslim's failure. The reason why our youth are becoming apostate is because their shahwat are leading them to shubuhat. There are two words. The first is shahwat, meaning desires. And the second is shubuhat, meaning doubts. And I'm giving the example of Pakistani universities, once again, Pakistani culture, because a lot of people, we uh, are from India and Pakistan, and we can easily relate to that culture. Every time when Christmas 
See, in Christmas season, you will see Christmas being celebrated in Pakistani universities. When Holi and Diwali come, you see that Holi and Diwali are being celebrated in Pakistani universities. Valentine's Day is celebrated in Pakistani universities. No restriction, no limitation. Only dunya and dunya and hubbu shahwat. Dating boys and girls, this is what they want. So when they think that the only challenge in fulfilling our desire is Islam. So they start raising, so their shahwat now lead them to shubuhat, meaning desires. Lead them to doubts. And then when they have doubts, they would like to substantiate that. They look for the arguments against Islam so that they can justify that our doubts are genuine. And that's how slowly they leave Islam. So, irtidad or apostasy, has, it's, it, it's not a challenge for Islam at all. In fact, Islam is the only religion that is believed to be the biggest challenge for the Western civilization and colonialists. All religions and all societies have already submitted to the Western civilization. You take the example of Hinduism. I oftentimes have an opportunity to uh, be engaged with Hindus when they represent their culture and their religion in my live stream. And they say that, yeah, we believe, you know, in Hinduism, you can do whatever you like to do. We are all secular. We like, we, we, we try to follow the laws that are introduced by the government, by the parliament. They're all secularist. They claim that they're Hindus, but they're not Hindus. They don't follow their own religion. They've already submitted to the Western civilization. You take the example of Christians and the Jews, and of course, many Muslims. But Islam is it standing high and will stand high, inshallah, summa inshallah, till the day of judgment in front of all such ideologies. So, respected brothers and sisters, the first gift that this post-colonialism or Western civilization offered, not to only Muslims, but to all people of faith, is atheism and apostasy. The second thing is liberalism. It is possible that some people, they subscribe to liberal ideas, liberal ideology, and they claim to be Muslims. They say that I am a Muslim. I believe in Allah. I believe in Rasulullah. I believe in the Quran. Okay, what did you say about gender equality? And that's when he exposes his liberalism. Yeah, I believe that men and women are equal. The moment he says that, it means he's a liberal. Because in Islam, men and women are not equal. It's not possible. I mean, they are different physiologically and psychologically. If we are physiologically and psychologically different, then our responsibilities should also be different. How is it possible that we are different in our physiology and psychology, but the, the, but the responsibilities are same? It is not possible. So it is a hoax. Those who say that men and women are equal, they are actually taking the advantage of our ignorance. The ignorance of our youth. This is nothing but emotional. On the, on the scientific ground, it's not true. On the philosophical ground, it's not true. On the rationalist ground, it's not true. On the empirical ground, it's not true. On which ground is true? Emotional ground. So liberalism is the second gift of the post-colonial era. And the third gift, is secularism. Secularism in short is the separation of the church and the state. In the Islamic context is the separation between a masjid and the state. You go to any Muslim country, almost every Muslim country, wherever you go, it is, whether they will call it Islamic Republic or Islamic this and that, but by its essence, it is a secular nation, it's a secular country. We have more than 50 countries, Muslim countries in the world. Hardly anyone, you can say, that it's a pure Islamic country. We have all secular countries. And it's a very unfortunate state of this ummah. And it is a result of colonialism and now post-colonialism. Well, a secular state has only two objectives. The first objective is the happiness of its people. And the second objective is the protection of the people's rights. But tell me one thing. Happiness 
It's a very subjective thing. You know, in secular countries, if one group is happy, the other is sad. In fact, the happiness of one group is on the cost of the sadness of the other group. So the citizens of that country can never be happy. For example, if in our time nowadays, if we have government by Democrats, so they're all happy because they're guys in, in, in the White House, but the Republicans are not. For then in the next election, what if a Republican is elected, then they will be happy, the other guys won't be, they will be sad. So the happiness of one group is the sadness of the other group. Happiness is very subjective thing. And the government can never provide happiness to its people. It's not possible. The second thing is rights. Well, let's talk about rights. When we say human rights, the fancy word human rights, oh, you know what, the Western countries, they support human rights. And this is what they're working for, you know, in Afghanistan and in Iraq and in uh, our Muslim countries, because these countries have failed to provide human rights, basic human rights to its citizens. This is nonsense. Why? Because human rights are based on a particular paradigm. A paradigm is designed by three things. Number one is epistemology. Number two is ontology. And number three is morality. Our epistemology and our ontology and our morality is, are completely different than the Western epistemology and ontology and morality. And therefore their paradigm is different. And all rights are based on that paradigm. So yes, they are protecting the human rights that are based on that paradigm, not the human rights that are based on our paradigm. And that's why our fundamental right that our prophet should not be mocked, our fundamental right that our Quran should not be burned is never protected. Why? Because it is against their epistemology, their ontology and their morality. It is against their paradigm, so it is not even considered as a right. So, secularism works for these two things and it does not provide these two things, the happiness and protection of rights to all of its citizens. Whereas, if you see the Islamic system, beautiful, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, He says that Alladheena in makkannahum fil ardi aqamu salata wa atawu zakata wa amaru bil ma'rufi wa nahu anil munkar. Allah azza wa jalla is praising people, mu'mineen, in makkannahum fil ardi when we give them power in any country, in the land of Allah. What they do? They do four things. Aqamu salah, they establish the prayer. The first duty of the Khalifa is to become Imam of the local masjid. That is first duty. Imagine if he is present in the masjid five times every day. Nobody will be as disciplined as the Khalifa himself. And in the salata tanha anil fahshai wal munkar. The beauty of salah is that if you are regular and punctual on your prayer, then you will not go near fahsha and near munkar evil. So if the Khalifa is like that, the whole society will be like that because nasu ala dini mulukihim. People follow the deen of their kings, their rulers. If the rulers are good, then everybody is good. The second thing is wa'atu zakata. They give zakat. See, the problems, half of the problems in our life that are related to our morality is because of our love for money. Zakat takes away that love. And the third thing is amaru bil ma'rufi wa nahu anil munkar. They command good in the society and they forbid people from evil. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also stated throughout in various nusus of the sharia in the Quran and Sunnah that how Amr bil ma'roof and Nahi anil munkar will be done. Amr bil ma'roof and Nahi anil munkar will be done in the light of the maqasid of the sharia, the purpose of the sharia. Now we're living a life that is purposeless. What is the purpose? The purpose is establishing Islam in the land of Allah. Because this is the deen of Allah. Inna deena in the Islam. But have we, just try to think about it, have we established Islam in our personal life? No, we didn't. What are the maqasid sharia there are five maqasid al-shari'a. Amar bil ma'roof and nahi anil munkar, whether you do it individually or you do it as a ruler, as the head of the state, you will do it in the light of these five things. The first thing is, hifz al-aql. The intelligence, one's intellect has to be protected. This is called hifz al-aql. Therefore, in that territory, 
where Islamic law is implemented, wine is prohibited, all alcoholic beverages are prohibited, no drugs, nothing. Why? Because they take over one's intellectual ability. The second purpose of the Sharia ah is the protection of one's lineage. And therefore, zina is prohibited. Doesn't matter if it is consensual or without consent. It is prohibited in Islam. And it's a very serious crime against Allah Azza wa Jal and His law. The third, the third thing is Hifzuddin, the protection of deen. Khalifa and the ruler of the Islamic State is the guardian. It is his responsibility to protect the deen of Allah in the land of Allah by, in, by implementing it, by propagating it, and by not allowing anybody to speak up against it. And that's why in the Islamic countries, we have apostasy law. Dare to speak against Islam. You lose your life because you are committing a crime against the state, against the Islamic state. So that is the third purpose of the Sharia. Ah. And the fourth purpose of the Sharia ah is Hifzul Mal, protection of wealth. And therefore, theft, robbery, of course there are crimes everywhere, but gambling is also a crime. Here in this country or in any secular setup, gambling is not a problem. So this is the fourth purpose of the Sharia ah, and the fifth purpose of the Sharia ah is the protection of life. And therefore, a person is not allowed to take an innocent life, who, whether that person is Muslim or non-Muslim. Life can be taken, illa bil haq, only if it is, if that person deserves that his life is taken. So these are five maqasid of the Sharia. Amr bil ma'roof and nahi anil munkar, that will be done by the government or by an individual, will be based on these five maqasid. Now we don't have the Islamic government, at least where we live. We live here as a Muslim community and that's it. You have very limited rights. So whatever rights you have, are you or are we implementing these five maqasid in our life? So at least there has to be some starting point. The starting point is that we try to implement these five maqasid. We do amar bil ma'roof and nahi anil munkar on this community level. And then we raise awareness throughout the world and we make one thing clear. And that is, it is fard, and I repeat it is fard, and I again say it is fard, to establish the Islamic government on every Muslim living in a Muslim, in a Muslim state. So, whether you are in Saudi, or you're in Pakistan, or you are in Malaysia, wherever you are, it is fard upon you that you live by the Islamic law, by the Islamic Sharia, ah, your constitution should be the Quran and the Sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And that is because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it clear that وَمَا كَانَ لِمُؤْمِنٍ وَلَا مُؤْمِنَةٍ إِذَا قَضَ اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ أَمْرًا أَنْ يَكُونَ لَهُمُ الْخِيَرَةُ مِنْ أَمْرِهِمْ That it is not possible for any mu'min, for any believing men and women that when Allah and the Messenger of Allah decide anything, they have any option, it is not possible. They have no option. Allah has decided that the land of Allah should be ruled by the, by the law of Allah and that's how it should be done. And it is our responsibility to raise awareness about it and it is their responsibility to implement it. I make dua that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us tawfiq to raise the kalimatul haq. I make dua that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us ambassador of Islam wherever we are. I make dua that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to spread and propagate the deen of Allah everywhere. جزاكم الله خير الجزاء وآخر دعوانا عن الحمد لله رب العالمين Uh, it's difficult to, to hear what, what what's the brother saying? Are the people? 
Yeah, so, okay, okay, yeah, inshallah. Yeah, so, uh, No, 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 no. I, I said, Anasu ala dini mulukihim, that people follow the deen of the rulers. So if the rulers are good, people are good. And if the rulers are bad, then the society becomes corrupt. No, it is not a general ruling. There are people, there are uh, communities, there are uh, places where people are very good. They are you know, practicing Muslims, but the rulers are bad. Yeah, it is possible. It's not qaida kulliya, it's not a, you know, universal law. Barakallah. Okay, so, <clears throat> there is a question, it says that if these Muslims' lands are all in the hands of post-colonialist rulers, should we support movements that want to overthrow them in whatever way we can? See, it's a very uh, interesting question and at the same time, if you go in theology, Islamic theology, you will find two different answers. <clears throat> the first answer is that, it's called khuruj by the way. So khuruj is permissible at a certain, in a, with certain conditions. That's one interpretation. The other interpretation is a little hardcore. And that's the predominant position of all the theologians. Not only the Salafis, by the way. The Ash'aris and the Maturidis and the Atharis, everybody. That khuruj is permissible only if kufr is bawah. Al-kufr al-bawah. Kufr, kufr means open kufr. The guy is committing open kufr. He's making laws that are against Islam, he's, uh, you know, forcing its people to follow rules that are against Islam, then yes, khuruj is permissible. So it is decided by the people who are living in that country, whether our rulers are doing this or not. And then if they think that yes, our rulers are doing it, then it is their call. It's not our call. We literally cannot do anything living, uh, you know, staying here in this country. Yes. Yeah, sorry about that. I will, inshallah. So the brother is asking the gist of this question. His question is that <clears throat> there are a lot of people, they, when they give speeches, they talk, when they lead, they are in the leading positions, they have been derailed from the purpose of the ummah. So what are the actions we can take to bring the ummah back? <clears throat> so I hope uh, I did justice with the rephrasing of your questions. So first of all, it is a very sad reality that our imams, our ulama, scholars, forget about whether they are talking about these issues or not. They're not even aware of these issues. Okay, and if they are aware of some of these issues, then they are, they don't feel comfortable in talking about them. And if they do, they're not allowed to speak. Just yesterday, I was uh, talking to one of my students who is from Chicago and his local masjid is not too far from here. So oftentimes when he is in town, he studies in a madrasa outside of Chicago. So when he comes back, he gets a chance to give Juma khutbah in that masjid. So he was telling me, I, when I asked him, so what do you want to be after you complete your alim course? He said that I want to do business. I said, well, you want to do business, then you should be in business school. You're in the alim program, uh, you do something, you should do something related to your alim program. So he said that, well, 
what can I do? I said, well, you can teach, you can be an imam. He said, well, I will never be an imam. I said, well, I agree with you. Neither I would ever want to become an imam. So, but I, know what, I want to know what is your reasons. So he said that my reason is that when I go back to my community and they give me an option to give Juma khutbah, they have a list of topics that you are allowed to speak on these topics only. And last time when I went there, they said, make sure that don't talk about Masjid Aqsa, don't talk about Palestine in your talk. It's not happening in Saudi Arabia. It's happening here in Chicago. So imagine if a scholar might lose his job as an imam because he speaks the truth where the board of that masjid is made of cowards, of those Rand report reformers, then we are not gonna hear ulama and scholars talking about these sensitive issues. Then we will not have so many options, so many avenues. One of these avenues will be a place like this. Otherwise, literally, we don't have many, many places. Now, the second part of the question is that what can we do? Well, we have to do a massive planning about our education system, starting from kindergarten all the way to college and university level. We have to make our education system independent of this secularism. There was such an initiative in, uh, 40 years ago in uh, Malaysia. There is a university where I completed my PhD, International Islamic University, Malaysia. And it was, the, the education system was made according to the proposals designed by Ismail Raji Farooqi, who was here in America, who was assassinated by the Zionists. So they built a university, it was during the time of Mahathir Muhammad when he was the Prime Minister. And the slogan of the university was Islamization of knowledge. So we want to Islamize all sciences, whether it's uh, biology or physics or medical science, very good. But they did what? They started scientifying Islam. So instead of Islamizing knowledge, they started scientifying the Quran and the Sunnah. And this is the main problem. So we need to take over our education system. And when our education system, and it is possible in this country, when our education system becomes independent, then only we will have the true reformers that we can call mujaddideen. Otherwise, we will have Rand report reformers sitting in every board in every masjid. And you won't be able to do anything, literally. There is, okay. All right, so there is a question. Say, let's say you are the Khalifa. What would your next five moves be? <laughs> well, I would have to first assign the chief of army staff, the prime minister, or the one who will take the finance and take care of the finance and the foreign policy. And then, obviously, I will uh, make my moves. But the first move, I don't know about five moves, but the first move, if I become the Khalifa, and I'm the first Khalifa, Imagine if I'm the first Khalifa, the first move that I will do, I will abolish the constitution of that region and I will establish the only and the only logical and rational constitution which is the Quran and the Sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. That will be my first move. The rest will follow. Okay, um, there is one, they're not in order, but anyways, I will uh, see this question came, is there, is there a Shari defined method that can resume Islamic way of life when whole system on Kufr? Okay, as I said, obviously it's a very uh, long topic, but I said that whatever you want to do in life, you start from yourself, you start from your home. And then you go to community and then society and to country. And that's how the entire nation is reformed. So are we implementing Islam on ourselves or not? Remember these five maqasid al-sharia. And remember, iqamatu salah, ita uz zakah, amr bil ma'roof and nahi anil munkar. These five, these four principles and under amr bil ma'roof and nahi anil munkar comes five maqasid of the sharia. This is the whole Islamic paradigm. 
So in whatever capacity we are able to implement Islam on our, li on our personal life and then our family life and then the whole community, we should do and we can do. any ideology or any movement becomes successful only when you create awareness. But be it humanism, liberalism, they all became successful or whatever, whether you call it success or not, because they had their education system in their hand. So if our education system is dependent on the sick mind, then obviously we're going to have sick, sick minded people leading us. So first we need to liberate our leadership and we will get our leadership only from the education system, because obviously those who are not qualified, those who are uh, uneducated, they're not going to be our leaders. The leaders will be educated class, people with education, people with vision, people with mind, people with Quran, with the Sunnah. So you need to have these people in the role of leadership and then only you can be successful. So obviously everything starts with education. This is why the first revelation of the Quran is Iqra, Bismi Rabbi Kalladi Khalaq. By the way, the, the education, uh, the, the, the question this brother asked that, is this the only way at reforming education system to move forward and to bring Islam on the top? <laughs> there are many different factors, but this is one of the most important ones. At least I don't see on the top. Okay, that's a very good question. Can you talk about the weaknesses of colonizers? See, <clears throat> our weakness is their strength, and our strength is their weakness. So the problem is that we do not have that strength, and the strength comes only when we have a clear vision and unity in the Ummah. And we are not divided. If we are divided, whether on the basis of our the skin of uh, the, the color skin or language or ideology or Salafi, Diobandi, Wahhabi, Barelvi, Diobandi, uh, whatnot. If we are divided on these lines, then that's our weakness. And our weakness is their strength. This is what they have been exploiting. Why they have been exploiting us for last uh, several hundred years. So one ummah is their weakness. And until we do not overcome our weakness, there is no point of talking about their weaknesses. There may be hundreds of them. But we need to work on our weakness first. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, Jazakumullah khairan mm-hmm. for this uh, great question. So he's asking that there is tahqiqul manat, and tahqiqul manat is a usul al fiqhi terminology, uh, which means that we have a nas, meaning we have a text, for example, a hadith. The hadith says that you must follow Amir, doesn't matter who he is, what, as long as the Amir is there, you must follow. Uh, but the tahqiqul manat is that he must have been appointed according to the shari'i methodology, shari'i method, and that method was never practiced. That is correct. But we need to go back in history and see after Khulafa Rashidin, was their method practiced during the time of Abbasiyah, during the time of Umayyah? Our scholars, historically, Aima Arba'a, all four of them, they lived the time of Banu Umayyah and Banu Abbas. And none of these Khulafa were appointed following the Islamic method. They, were, they became Khulafa because they came from a certain family. Their family background was the main reason why they were Khulafa. Otherwise, who knew Walid bin Abdul Malik? Who knew Marwan? Who knew Harun al-Rashid? What was so special about uh, Mamun al-Rashid and Wasir Billah? Nothing except for their family uh, background. Yet all the four Imams of the four schools of thought unanimously agree that there will be no khuruj. Why? Because there is a possibility of bloodshed. And bloodshed is something that we as a Muslim ummah has to have to avoid as long as it is possible. So tahqiqul manat is that there shouldn't be any khuruj unless if there is kufrun bawah. Yes. Oh, so, all right. Okay, okay. Okay. So, number seven, um, there's a question. What is the best way to teach our children the reality of the education system they are part of? Okay, that's a very uh, interesting question again. Uh, MashaAllah, my son is there. He's 10 year old. His name is Ahmad Nadim. Can you stand up? Yeah, so sit down. <laughs> Mashallah. So just uh, wanted you to see him. He's not a superhero or a star here. He's just a normal kid. But Alhamdulillah, summa alhamdulillah, we as parents are very concerned about his dini upbringing. And this is the fadl of Allah and nothing else. This is the fadl of Allah. So we discuss different issues, different sensitive issues about him. So for example, just day before yesterday, I was asking him, so Ahmed, tell me one thing. Um, what are the sources of knowledge? How do you know what you know? Now this is a question related to epistemology. Epistemology is a branch of philosophy. You don't study epistemology until your college and university days, and that is that too if you're taking philosophy classes. So he said, well, if it is the matter of deen, then the source of knowledge is the Quran and the Sunnah. And if it is the matter of dunya, then yes, we can follow science. So I said, okay, what if there is a clash? Then what are you going to do? He said, of course, Quran. So, alhamdulillah, I'm very pleased that he answered this. You know, these are the, this is the dialogue that you have to have on dinner table, when you are with your children, when you're going somewhere with them, you ask them different questions and you read their mind, what they think, what are they learning from their schools, from the education system. See, the thing is that we as parents are not educated first. We have to be educated first and then only we can educate our children. Yes. The next online question is that, uh, what is it? Salam of Tisab, in case of Gaza, people ask to seek help from senators, etc. Is it Islamically allowed? And is there any evidence for it? Jazakallah khairan. I was here when our brother Shirazi was giving his talk. Towards the end of his talk, he was making this point that I fully agree. I mean, those people who are bombing them day and night, those people who are supporting Zionism from the time they wake up from their bed until the time they go to bed, those people who ask for votes on the, in the name of Zionism, those people who live 
for Zionism and they will die for Zionism, you're asking help from them? How is it possible? What, will he get, what is he going to do? You are his voter, for instance. You'll give him a call and he say, yes, we'll do something. And he's not going to do anything. See, what is the solution that you're asking from him? Ceasefire? Okay, they, that may be a solution for some people. Two-state solution? Well, that's not the solution for the people who are being bombed every day. They don't like that solution. So what are you talking to them? What are you talking to them about? Two-state solution or one-state solution? Try to, try to propose one-state solution to any of the senators in this country. And see what he says. Because if he raises, if he opens his mouth about one-state solution, he's not going to be elected next time. So we are living with this sad reality. So we need to wake up and we need to do what is right to do and stop relying on these people. The next online question is, okay, there's just dua that came from the sister side, Jazakumullah Khairan. What is more dangerous, the physical colonization or the intellectual colonization? I remember there was a book in our Alim course curriculum long time ago. I, did, I read that book in 2001. It was written by Hassan Az-Zayyat, an Egyptian scholar whose uh, expertise was Arabic literature. So he made a statement, and I really liked at that time that statement. Inna isti'bada ruhi aqbahu min isti'bad al jism. Which means that if people's mind and their intellect is made slave, is enslaved, it is worse than enslaving their body. So enslaving your mind and your soul is worse than enslaving your body. Because if you are physically slaves, you know that you're slave. You will do something to get out of that slavery. But if you are mentally slaves, you won't do anything because you think that you're free and you're not free. And that is worse than being physically slave. Okay, there is another question. How can we support the scholars so they can feel secure? Where did it go? Uh, they can feel secure speaking the truth to power. Mm. Well, you know, it's a long process. First of all, the masajid, where the scholars usually give their talks, where you find the scholars, they have to be liberated. Our, our, uh, our scholars, they are paid by the masajid and the masajid board. The boards are the, they're the, they're the employer. The employee does what the employer wants. If the employers are the puppets of the colonizers, so obviously you will not expect from these scholars to say anything. So we need to liberate these masajid and have the right-minded people there. You know, alhamdulillah, summa alhamdulillah, in our masjid where I give some time speeches from time to time, at least once in every month, there's no pressure on me. I can say whatever I want to say. Nobody questions, oh, why did you make this statement and that statement? Alhamdulillah, summa alhamdulillah, in the light of the Quran and the Sunnah, what I think is correct, I speak. And I also go to other masajid um, in the area. And my condition is that I will speak and I will say whatever I like to say. The moment, try to say one thing that, no, Mufti Sahib, you cannot talk about this, I'm not coming. There was one masjid in our area, Four years ago, I was banned from there because I spoke against feminism. So, you know, this is the reality of Masajid, unfortunately. Yeah.
to Muslims first and then go to non-Muslims? The question is that is there a priority between spreading the words of Allah to Muslims versus spreading the words of Allah to non-Muslims? I think the, both of these two things go together, side by side. It's not like, let's spread the words of Allah among Muslims first. When every Muslim is rectified and reformed, then we go to non-Muslims. That's not going to happen. It will never happen. You will never be able to achieve your goal. So these two things go side by side. See, we are, as we are Ummatul Ijaba, we are also Ummatul Da'wah. And the meaning of Ummatul Da'wah is that we have to live our life calling non-Muslims towards Islam, propagating Islam. And we are not doing that. Now think about this, I, I, I must give this example. There are only um, one Shaykh in America who publicly gives Da'wah to non-Muslims in one of the parks in California, right? I cannot be more specific than this, right? You all know him. He's the most popular sheikh. Why? Because he is the one doing it. So we don't have more sheikhs in this country. We don't have more Muslims in this country, more du'at. There are so many, but nobody's doing it. One person is doing it, and of course, he's, he's, he's popular, mashallah. I'm not, I'm not saying anything negative about him. What I'm saying is that he's doing a good work and he's being praised and appreciated by all people. But we need so many people like that. So if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you knowledge, then you must spread this knowledge. I have a student um, in um, Ohio, in Cleveland. He's not a scholar. He studied some courses of atheism and liberalism under me for in the last couple of years. So mashallah, every weekend he goes to nearby park and he has a booth. And he invites people to Islam. He said, how I asked him, how many people have accepted Islam so far? He said, well, not many, but I'm doing my part. And that's, that is what is required. It's not necessary that you convert like 100 people or you have a, you have a goal that I must convert like everybody uh, or uh, one person in each session. No, it's not necessary. Even if you become means of guidance for one person, that is better than, as Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, red camels. They were the most expensive camels in the uh, time of Rasulullah alayhi salatu wa salam. So we have to be ummatul da'wah. We have to be the walking instruments of da'wah. Whether we are in university campuses or, uh, you know, in our jobs, offices, wherever we are, da'wah should be our priority, da'wah to non-Muslims. Okay, so the last question that came, or the, the latest, what is the Islamic solution for the Gaza and Palestine issue? MashaAllah, whatever the issue, whatever the solution is, is being taken place. But obviously the Ummah has to wake up. The Ummah is dead. So, and the rulers have the responsibility. And I've said this multiple times in my speeches. None of them, inshaAllah, summa inshaAllah, and I make dua, none of them will go through on the day of judgment through Siratul Mustaqim before answering this question, what have you done for the people of Palestine? This is their respons first responsibility. I don't know how they sleep. So, of course, the general public, it is their respons moral responsibility, but we don't own, um, we don't have army, we don't have weapons, we don't have resources. You know, think about, uh, Turkey, for example, the Turkish president, Amir al Mu'minin. <laughs> so he has been talking about, as a, he is acting as a, social, as, a, as a social justice warrior on social media, on Twitter. He's making tweets, like long tweets, you know, people of Palestine, we are with them. You know, what are you, these Zionists doing? So, and everywhere, mashallah, subhanallah. But the oil to Israel is coming through Turkey, from Azerbaijan. Azerbaijan is under your influence. What are you doing for this? Nothing? So what's the, what's the point of crying and tweeting about the plight of the people of Gaza? So the biggest responsibility is on them. And they will not cross the bridge without answering this question. Jazakumullah khairil jaza. Wa akhiru da'wana alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin.